before we read God's word, let's bow and ask his blessing upon us. Gracious God and Father, as we open your word this evening, we realize that we may be tired in body or in mind, and yet it is your word that gives life unto our souls and joy unto our hearts. Give us that joy this evening. Bring to us by your spirit the light that will illuminate our understanding, O God, that will help us to see more clearly in scripture what we have not previously seen. Bless us, lead us, Guide us, O God, into a deeper appreciation of your truth, and bless us, O God, that we may walk in a manner consistent with your revealed will. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Acts chapter 22, beginning at verse 12, this is the word of God. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony among all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Congregation, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Now, tonight we're beginning a multi-part series on baptism, and it's part of the larger series of studies that we have undertaken since 2015 on the major doctrines of the Christian faith. Uh, In the interest of full disclosure, many of you know this already, but we try to keep an ongoing study of both an Old Testament book, a New Testament book, as well as a series like this on Christian doctrine throughout the year. Obviously, there will be seasons or weeks where we may take a break or need to look at something else, but we want this to be an ongoing study of the major doctrines of the Christian faith because we realize that we come to these ideas at different times and are able to see more at later times than we did before. Our children are getting older, new members are joining the church, new visitors are arriving, and we ourselves are changing even as we grow and mature in Jesus Christ. I know that many of the things that I have come to see and to understand were first introduced to me many years ago, but perhaps were introduced at a time where I was not able to really appreciate them, maybe not even to understand them. Sometimes it's as if the light bulb comes on, you're reading a passage that you know very well, and suddenly with blinding clarity you see something that you never noticed before, or you understand something that you'd always struggled uh, to understand or had been confused by previously, and you say, what was different? It was there in the text all along. But God's Spirit continues to mature you in your faith and in your understanding and helps you to grow in grace. And so someone asked me this morning, are we coming back to baptism again because there's some problem with regard to this? No, no, it's just that we need the regular exposure to these major doctrines that are taught to us in the Word of God. Now, several weeks ago, in fact, a couple of months ago, we uh, studied in the kind of the last unit of this particular series three lessons on the sacraments. And I want to encourage you uh, to remember that material or maybe even to go back and refresh your memory of that material, especially if you were not here. There is so much in those three lessons that lays the groundwork for understanding baptism and the Lord's Supper. This is one of the things that I appreciate in particular about our confession tradition is the fact that the Westminster Confession of Faith, like several other of the Reformed standards, has an entire chapter devoted just to the doctrine of sacraments, even before it gets into a specific discussion of particular sacraments. I think that's helpful, and it may be even more helpful today than it was 400 years ago. 400 years ago, the church did not have the same kind of reticence or antipathy with regard to the language of sacraments that we have in Western evangelicalism today. When people hear you use the word sacrament, they immediately think Roman Catholicism, and it doesn't help that the pastor's wearing a dress as he's talking about the sacraments. They think, oh my, this must be some kind of high church sacerdotal uh, ministry. 
But in fact, the idea of the sacraments is richly biblical. We saw in that previous study that our word sacrament has really just been borrowed and carried over from the early church. It's based upon a Latin word that was used in the early church in order to describe baptism and the Lord's Supper and its relationship to this idea in the New Testament of the mysteries of Christ, the means by which God visibly communicates communicates and confirms his promises to his people. And I don't want to go back over all of that material, but I do want to point you back to that material to say that if you're struggling a little bit with the idea of a sacrament or even using that term uh, of something like baptism in the Lord's Supper, that material is there and may be helpful to you. Now tonight we begin in Acts chapter 22. We'll make reference to many other passages as we go. But before we get into the topic, as it were, that we're looking at, let me suggest three things that we see very clearly in our text that will be very important during the course of our study tonight. First of all, in this passage we see that baptism identifies a person with Christ. When Saul of Tarsus came to the city of Damascus, he did not come as a Christian or for the purpose of becoming a Christian. In fact, he came in order to persecute Christians. It's as he is on the way, it's while he is on the road that he becomes a believer in Jesus when he sees the Lord. But if I could make a distinction here, and I don't want to overdevelop or overemphasize this distinction, but if I could make a distinction here that is consistent with something we said this morning in our study of ordination, it would be this. Saul became a believer in Jesus on the road, but he became visibly a Christian in the city. Do you understand the distinction I'm making? He becomes a believer in Jesus when he sees the risen Jesus on the road and suddenly realizes this is indeed the Messiah. He believes in him. He trusts in him. He is clearly a penitent man as he comes to the city. But what happens when he comes to the city? Ananias comes and presents to him God's commissioning him as an evangelist to the nations, as an apostle, and then he calls on him to be baptized. And in that baptism, what happens? Suddenly, Saul is no longer identified as a Jewish persecutor of the church, but rather as a fulfilled Jew, as a Jew who has come to believe in his Messiah, who has come to be identified with this person, Jesus of Nazareth, whom he takes to be correctly the Christ. And so we said this morning that a person might be baptized and thereby be a Christian, but if he doesn't trust in Jesus, he's an unsaved Christian. Well, here we see just the opposite. Saul is trusting in Jesus. He is a penitent believer before he is baptized. But when he is baptized, what happens? It's as if he puts on Christ. This is the very language, in fact, that Paul himself will use in writing to the church in Galatia, as we will see later in our study tonight. Baptism identifies a person with Christ. It is a public and visible sign of that association, that this is a person who is with Jesus and no longer against him. Secondly, baptism is associated with the washing away of sins. And I think this is the the aspect of verse 16 that may be so strange to so many people today and that would even cause some evangelicals to cringe. You know, this, this whole sermon is difficult because we're talking about sacraments, which itself is uncomfortable language, and now we're saying, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And we want to say, no, 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 sins are not washed away in baptism. But here it is in the Bible. Here is this language that needs to be acknowledged, that must be reckoned with. Paul's sins were forgiven through faith in Christ. Make no mistake about that. The, this passage and no other passage says otherwise. Saul's sins are forgiven through faith in Christ, but they are visibly, they are publicly removed in baptism. They're forgiven through faith. They're washed down the drain, as it were, in baptism. Do you see the distinction? We're not suggesting that baptism was the way in which Saul received justification before God. But there is a public vindication of his justification. There is a demonstration of the fact that he's a forgiven man in his baptism. The outward sign of baptism is a demonstration of the inward work of grace upon Paul's heart. 
And that is why Ananias can say what he does. He says, get up, be baptized, wash away your sins. Don't remain there looking in the same way that you have, in the same place that you've been publicly. Be rid of this. Wash it away. Wash it down the street and enter into a new life. And then third, baptism is an act of calling upon the Lord. And of course, calling upon the Lord is associated in Scripture with salvation. How is a person saved in the Bible? Both Old and New Testaments, they are saved by calling on the name of the Lord. But this passage associates baptism with that call. Now, the baptism is not that call, but it is associated with that call. That baptism is not calling on the name of the Lord, and yet it's an outward sign of calling on the name of the Lord. Do you see the connection? This is one of the things that we said with regard to the doctrine of the sacraments. You cannot collapse the sign and what it signifies into one another. You must not make that mistake. This is the mistake in many churches and their sacramentology. This is the error, for instance, of transubstantiation. As Jesus says, this bread is my body, this cup is my blood. And so Rome concludes, the bread becomes Jesus' body, the cup becomes Jesus' blood. You say, no, 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 (laughs) there's a sign and what it signifies, and you've collapsed the two into one another. You can't do that. But neither can you make the mistake that many Protestant and evangelicals make, and that is to divorce the two. (laughs) To say, we're going to set the sign somewhere way over there, and we're going to set the signified way over there. No, 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 no. Baptism is not calling on the name of the Lord, and baptism is an outward sign of calling upon the name of the Lord. It's a visible demonstration of something that ultimately is happening in the heart. It's not as though Paul remained unsaved until his baptism. But it is to say that he responds to God's call of grace in his baptism. In other words, he visibly is seen to be a person who is looking to God in faith, who is calling upon God in faith for this salvation. And I think in many churches, this connection is lost. It is overlooked. Or in some, it may even be explicitly denied. And yet, that connection is explicitly made in the Scriptures. It's it's astonishing to me, as a matter of fact, in many revivalistic churches, that you can have an altar call where people are going to receive salvation through raising their hands. Or they're going to receive salvation through signing a card. Or they're going to receive salvation by coming forward and praying a sinner's prayer with someone. I don't have any particular objection to any of those things. The only problem is you don't see any of those things in the Bible. (laughs) You do actually see this, though. You see people crying out to Peter and the other apostles on the day of Pentecost and saying, what must we do to be saved? And he says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Here's a visible outward demonstration of this inward looking to God in faith. Now, tonight, by way of summarizing some of the ideas that we want to cover, we're going to look at Article 1 of Chapter 28 in the Westminster Confession of Faith. We'll say again, as we've said many times, we're not setting this confession alongside of Scripture. We're certainly not setting it up as a secondary source of authority or a rival to Scripture. But the Westminster Confession of Faith is a helpful and historic summary of the teaching of Scripture. We find it to be a useful instrument in this regard, and it has been useful in this way to many, many of our fathers in the faith, and is an instrument of unity in so many parts of the visible church today. Article 1 of chapter 28 says this, quote, Baptism is a sacrament of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ, not only for the solemn admission of the party baptized into the visible church, but also to be unto him a sign and seal of the covenant of grace, of his engrafting into Christ, of regeneration, of remission of sins, and of his giving up unto God through Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life which sacrament is by Christ's own appointment to be continued in his church until the end of the world, end quote. Now, you can see a number of features that are identified in that quotation, ways in which baptism is used as a symbol in Scripture and in the ministry of the church in relation to our faith and salvation. You can also kind of cross-reference this, if you will, to the larger catechism, question 165. I won't take the time to read that tonight, but you can find that easily enough. It's even in the back of your hymnal that you have with you tonight. 
But tonight what I want to do is just briefly walk through, kind of in a, in a, a, a quick review, what baptism is as a sign and seal of the covenant of grace, and then march through several of these things that baptism is said to represent. I'm not going to use the confessions list of these connections. I'm going to, to use a little bit of a more expansive list that goes beyond that. But, but basically the same idea to, to walk through in summary fashion some of the ways in which baptism signifies and seals or communicates and confirms these various aspects of grace. When we say that baptism is a sacrament, we really mean that they are signs and seals of covenant grace that they are given by Christ to the church for our ongoing use during the present age. And what is a sign? It's something that points to something else. It's something that points beyond itself to another. And in this case, as a sign, baptism points visibly to an invisible work. It points us to something that we might otherwise not notice, that we might not otherwise see. This invisible work of grace that God promises, that He applies, and that He confirms to believers. And sacraments are for all believers to receive. In fact, this goes back to some of our previous studies where we noted the fact that some Christian traditions uh, identify more than two sacraments. Rome, for example, has seven. And yet some of the sacraments, as they identify them, are not for all believers. Not all believers are to be ordained as priests, for example. Not, all, no, not, no, not any priests in Rome's communion are, are, are to receive the sacrament of marriage. Sacrament is the wrong category for these kinds of things. To say that God has appointed certain institutions and uses certain institutions for the good of His people is not to say that all of those institutions are therefore sacramental. But when we talk about the sacraments, as Scripture identifies these ordinances that Christ has given to His church for use in the present age, they are for everyone. Baptism is for all of God's people. The Lord's Supper is for all of God's people. We are all to receive them. We are all to benefit from them. We are all to enjoy them until Jesus returns. And in baptism, we are seeing and receiving the promise of God's grace in Christ. That's, that's what's going on in baptism. This is why in Romans chapter 6, in the passage that we read earlier in our study or in our, in our worship this evening, Paul says, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now, there is a rhetorical sense in which he is saying, do you not know? But as an aside, without anticipating too much of our later discussion of the baptism of covenant children, could I point out here that the fact that there might be some who are ignorant of certain aspects of baptismal theology does not invalidate their baptism. In other words, Paul does not say your baptism is only valid or your baptism is only significant or your baptism is only substantive if you already understand all of these things. Now, who among us understands all of these things? We're trying to understand. We're growing in our understanding. There is a rhetorical sense in which Paul is reminding many of them of things that they had not previously known, and yet how many of you in a study of baptism or the Lord's Supper or something like that have not run across ideas that you didn't know? And you say, I, ne I never realized that. I didn't understand that when I was baptized. Oh, should I go back and be re-baptized? No. No, but what you should do is grasp now the greater riches of this truth that God has made known to you by His Spirit. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, a passage that we'll refer to again, Paul says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This is the way that Scripture talks about baptism. This is why we said what we did just a little while ago with regard to Paul's baptism in Acts chapter 22. He is identified with Jesus. He is putting off a life of persecution. He is putting on this position in Jesus. It's a sign of Christ. And it is a sign of the righteousness of Christ which is received through faith. A professing believer confesses his faith in baptism. Yes, certainly. When Saul says, yes, Ananias, please baptize me, we see, okay, he really does believe in Jesus. He, re he really is changing sides here. This is a true conversion. But that is not the primary significance of Paul's baptism. 
The primary significance of Paul's baptism, as Ananias clearly says, is the washing away of sins. It's what's, what God is doing to you, on you, for you, not just what you're saying. It's not just you. Paul, you need to do this, but it's, but it's Paul, you need to receive this so that you might see more clearly and all might see what God is doing to you, for you, and with you. Baptism signifies and seals the gospel of Jesus Christ and our relationship to Him. As a sign, baptism communicates and affirms certain truths about Christ which are true for all who trust in Him. And again, this is an objective sign. We will develop this idea a little bit tonight and more in coming weeks. There is an objectivity to this sign so that if you are baptized and you don't trust in Jesus, the sign is still just as true. So if this building, God forbid, catches fire tonight, we have several exits marked, right? We have exit signs over these doors, and that is an exit. And if you choose to remain in your seat and burn to death, that exit sign is still true in what it communicates. You say, what if a person is baptized but isn't trusting in Jesus? The problem is not with the baptism, brothers and sisters. <laughs> the problem was with the recipient of the baptism. Baptism objectively communicates certain truths. You say, but if an unbeliever is baptized, their sins are not washed away. But baptism declares a truth about the washing away of sins that is true objectively, universally, and received by all who trust in Christ. And what we need to do is have a, perhaps a much more objective view of baptism than many evangelicals do. As a seal, baptism confirms and authenticates that everyone who trusts in Christ receives this grace. When we talk about seal here, we're not talking about Tupperware. We're talking about the kind of seal that a king uses on an official document. We're talking about the seal that a notary public places upon uh, your, your mortgage or some kind of a legal document. It's an authentication. And baptism is a mark of authentication to say this person is truly connected to Christ. Now this person will not be saved unless they are trusting in Christ. And here is the difference between the person who by God's grace perseveres unto everlasting life and the person who becomes an apostate who is cut off, the unfruitful branch that is removed and burned. And yet both people have a connection, not the same connection, not a lasting connection, but a connection nonetheless to Jesus. Baptism is an objective seal in that regard, even though what it seals can only be enjoyed through faith. Now let me run through some of these ideas very briefly that baptism communicates and affirms. First of all, it signifies and seals entrance into the visible church. In fact, baptism is where, when, and how a person becomes a member of the visible church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2, we mentioned a few moments ago on the day of Pentecost, Peter and the other apostles preach the gospel to the assembled multitudes. Many are convicted of their sin. They cry out in verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Added to who? Added to the disciples. Added to the church. Who was added to the church? Those who received his word gladly. How do you know who received his word gladly? They were baptized. You see, baptism is the dividing line here, right? You knew who was in the church and who was not in the church based upon the application of baptism. Those who gladly received his word signified that by being received through baptism into the visible church. 3,000 were added to their number. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, By one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. And we cannot dismiss this connection by appealing to a difference between water and spirit baptisms. This is one of the common things that you'll hear among Protestant evangelicals, but it is a distinction foreign to the Scriptures. 
You don't see Scripture making this kind of separation between water and spirit baptism. No, we're baptized into one body by one spirit when we are baptized in the name of the triune God. And I don't deny that there can be a distinction that is made to say, obviously, not all of those who are baptized with water are baptized by the Holy Spirit. And I would assume that Saul, having received the blessing of Christ by the Spirit and coming to faith on the road to Damascus, has already, in that sense, been baptized by the Spirit before he is ever baptized with water. There's a distinction, certainly, but those cannot be divorced. And they certainly cannot be set at odds with one another. And yet I've had people do that very thing. They say, no, 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 uh, you are baptized by the Spirit into one body, and that has nothing to do whatever with water baptism. It doesn't matter whether you're baptized with water. It doesn't matter whether you're a part of the church. How can you be part of Christ and not be part of the church? You're, you're, you're saying that I'm willing to date Christ, but I don't want to be married to him. You're saying I want to, I want to be saved by Jesus, but I don't want to be engrafted into his body. You say, well, no, no, I, I guess I want to be part of the church. Well, the way you come into the church is by baptism. That's what you see again and again in the New Testament. Sometimes people will try to avoid this connection by appealing to differences between the visible and the invisible church. And each, each of those senses are important. And, and obviously, there is a distinction to be made. There are people who are in the invisible universal church, we might say, who are not in a visible local congregation. And there are certainly some people who are in visible local congregations who do not savingly belong to Jesus Christ. Michael Horton says this in his work, The Christian Faith, quote, Visible and invisible refer not to two different churches, much less do they correspond to true and false, but to the body of Christ as known to God in eternity and is known to us now as a mixed assembly, end quote. And that's the, that's the right distinction to make. To say, yeah, it's true that the invisible church and the visible church are not the same thing, but they are two aspects of the same thing. There are not two different churches. There is one church. One of them right now is a mixed assembly. It will later be purified and purged, right? One of them is eschatological. It is perfect and holy and true. Secondly, baptism is a picture, promise, and path to a living connection and relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what you see in the passage we read earlier in our study in Romans chapter 6. You were baptized into Jesus' death so that just as you have shared in His death, so you may share in His resurrection. Just as He has died unto sin, you have died unto sin. Just as He is alive unto righteousness, so you are alive unto righteousness. This is what baptism does. It visibly connects us to Christ. It grafts us into him so that we may receive all of his benefits. And again, please don't misunderstand. We're not suggesting that baptism does this work by itself. That when a person is baptized, this is what is happening, and not until then, and not unless then. No, 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 that's not what we're saying. But what we are saying is that this is what is visibly happening in baptism. What is invisibly true is visibly happening here. Baptism does not impart any saving grace or blessings of Christ's work without or apart from faith. But it does tangibly connect us to the Lord and Savior, who is the source of all grace and blessings. And so in that sense, baptism is like a marriage ceremony in which we put on the name of another. And we enter into a relationship with another. And sure, you can, you can be married legally without having a marriage ceremony. And yet that ceremony is not insignificant, is it? Right? When the, when the minister says, I now pronounce you husband and wife, there's a, a legal pronouncement that's creating a, re- a relational reality. And it is akin to what we see happening in baptism. Third, baptism signifies and seals the forgiveness of sins. And in fact, this is central to its meaning. We see in Acts chapter 2 that we already read in Acts chapter 22, our original passage this evening, and in so many other places. In fact, this language first appears in relation to the baptism of John. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 4 and in Luke chapter 3, John baptized with a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's the same phrase in Greek. This is the, the connection of, with regard to baptism that is even brought out in creedal statements like the Apostles and the Nicene Creed. We believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And yet, people recite that on the Lord's Day. They say, do, do, do we really believe that? <laughs> are, we, are, are we supposed to believe that? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit conflicted. Well, yes, the, the Bible talks in these very ways. 
In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, In Christ you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Wasn't that a beautiful idea? I'm circumcised like Jesus, with Jesus, by Jesus, and by that we mean the sinful flesh is cut away. And Paul continues, Buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. What does baptism have to do with that? This is the theology and symbology of baptism. Oh, a person's sins are forgiven through faith in Christ alone. It's not through baptism. Saul's sins are forgiven on the road as he sees the risen Lord and trusts in him. But don't underestimate the significance, the significance of baptism in communicating and confirming this promise of the forgiveness of sins. In fact, I believe that this is being alluded to in Ephesians chapter 5 when Paul, in talking about marriage, compares this to Christ's relationship to the church. He says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. The washing of water. Well, baptism is talking to us about that. When you see water poured out upon a person in the name of the triune God, you are being reminded, it's communicating and confirming to you that Christ cleanses his bride by the word, even as water cleanses the body. Fourth, baptism is a sign and seal of our death to sin and to the death of our sinful nature as we are joined to Christ. In fact, there are a number of uh, passages in the New Testament that speak in this very way. Some of these we will unpack later in our study uh, in in future weeks. I'm not going to go into them tonight, but let me mention just briefly the image of circumcision that we saw in Colossians chapter 2, the idea of co-crucifixion with Jesus in Romans chapter 6, the connection with the flood in 1 Peter chapter 3, where Peter says, baptism now saves you. Well, of course, it's not baptism, right? But the, the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But, but, but nonetheless, ba- baptism. Baptism is the antitype. Baptism is the fulfillment of this flood imagery from the Old Testament. God is pouring out judgment on the world of ungodliness. And he's bringing you safely through the water of judgment into everlasting life. The Red Sea crossing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All of these help us understand this aspect of baptismal theology. Baptism is a judgment. But it's a watery judgment that we pass safely through. Baptism is God bringing wrath upon the sin that surrounds and overwhelms us so that we might be brought through judgment, through death, into life and glory. All of those images and connections make that very point. Most of us would not think to appeal to baptism in relation to a person's sanctification, right? If I'm, as a pastor, I'm counseling someone who has some kind of a sinful habit or pattern of life, I'm probably not going to say, haven't you been baptized? Don't, don't you remember what your baptism is all about? I, I, maybe my mind wouldn't work that way, but that's exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, isn't it? He says, don't, don't you know that you were baptized into Jesus' death? You can't live like this anymore. You've been baptized. Right? Baptism is communicating and confirming the death of the old man. But fifth, it is also symbolizing and communicating the new life that we have in Christ In fact, Paul says to Titus in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, it is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to God's mercy that he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, I see, and and again, please, I, I want to be very respectful when I say this. Please don't misunderstand when I say I have seen people do hermeneutical gymnastics trying to avoid any connection to baptism in some of these passages we're reading tonight. Almost every passage that we've read so far, I have had someone at some point, and sometimes many people at multiple points, insist, no, 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 that's that's not about baptism. Romans chapter 6, that's about spirit baptism, not water baptism. 1 Corinthians 12, that's spirit baptism, not water baptism. Uh, Ephesians 5, that cannot be an allusion to baptism, obviously. Uh, Titus chapter 3, washing of regeneration, no way that that could be baptism. And and yet, by, by the way, if you read the early Christian writings, if you read the church fathers, all of them see it as baptism, all of them. There's not even a question about this. Does that mean that baptism itself regenerates? No. No. 
But remember the danger of overcorrecting and ending up in the ditch on the other side of the road. To deny any allusion to, any connection with, any symbolic relation to baptism risks separating the very rich and wonderful allusions that God is making by His Spirit in His Word. No, baptism does not regenerate, but baptism is like a washing of regeneration. We we are being born to new life. In fact, baptism is a visible sign that is preaching to us the very same truth that Jesus preached to Nicodemus. So we've, we've made this point many times. I won't belabor the point. But John 3, when Jesus says to Nicodemus, a man must be born of water and the Spirit, else he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. I do not, I'm not persuaded that Jesus is talking about baptism. I am completely persuaded that baptism is talking about John 3. Completely. When Jesus says in John chapter 6, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you, I'm not persuaded he's talking about the Lord's Supper. But I am completely persuaded the Lord's Supper is talking to us about John 6. You see, the polarity works the other direction. Baptism is communicating something to us, is confirming something to us that is a truth larger than just that rite or ritual. And it's the very same truth that Jesus is speaking of in those conversations Baptism signifies and seals the new life of kingdom membership and spiritual communion which those who are baptized enjoy as part of the body of Christ. And that life, by the way, can be referred to as regeneration. In fact, this is exactly how Jesus uses it in Matthew chapter 19. I'm not suggesting that that's the only sense or even the primary sense of regeneration. When we use the term regeneration, we have in mind a very specific technical sense, right? We are talking about when God gives to a person a new heart and the grace to believe in Christ. Praise God for that. It's spoken of in so many passages of Scripture. But in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus describes to the apostles a time in the age that is ahead in the reign of the Messiah when they will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And he says this will happen in the regeneration. It's in the time of new life, in other words. He's not using it in the technical sense of the shorter catechism or the confession of faith, but he's talking about it in the sense of this new life of communion. We live in a whole new world. We have been raised from death and seated with Christ in heavenly places. And if you have been raised with Christ, you are called to seek those things which are above, because that is where Christ is. Sixth, baptism is the formal dedication of a person to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that is why it is used in the Great Commission that it, in the way that it is. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go and baptize people and teach them how to follow me. Jesus is Lord. He has all authority. The response to that authority is to be identified with the Father, Son, and Spirit in baptism. This is why in Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, when Philip comes to Samaria and preaches Christ there, it says, when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. When they believed the message of the kingdom, when they believed that Jesus is King and Lord, they were baptized. Because baptism is a consecration to God's service. And then baptism communicates and confirms our adoption as God's children. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, Paul says in Galatians 3. And then he continues... There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. You're children of Abraham. And yet, where does he visibly connect this? To baptism. Oh, baptism doesn't accomplish those realities, but baptism does communicate and confirm those realities. That God has made peace, He has brought us near, He has brought us into His family, He's made us members of the household of God. We are not God's children by nature. We are adopted into His family by grace, and we become His sons. And some of you have experience with this, right? Either through adoption in your own family or adoption with friends, and you know how special that moment is when you meet with the judge, and the judge says, this child now belongs as a part of this family, right? This child is yours. Well, that's what baptism is. God is saying, you are mine. You are mine, and you belong to me. And finally, 
Baptism signifies and seals God's promise that we will be raised by Christ on the last day. There's a lot more here that I need to unpack, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to tonight. But let me just point you to the breadcrumb trails, as it were. Baptism is connected in the Bible to the gift of the Spirit. In fact, this is exactly what Peter says on Pentecost. He says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't receive the Spirit just by virtue of the fact that we get wet in the name of the triune God. But there's the connection, is that in baptism, we are connecting with this promise of the Spirit. But what does Paul say about the gift of the Spirit? He says, if the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will also raise you. And not just raise you right now from your death in sin, but he will raise you on the last day out of the grave and bring you into the new heavens and earth. And this is why, by the way, Paul is able to connect in Ephesians chapter 4 the one baptism that we share in together as the people of God with the one hope that we have, which has never been the rapture, by the way. It's always been the resurrection We are visibly united to the work of the Spirit in baptism just as the Spirit came visibly upon Jesus at His baptism. And the New Testament says that if the Spirit is upon us as He is, then He will be in us and bring us into that resurrection life on the last day. Baptism is a Christian's adoption certificate and wedding ring. All of these analogies are inadequate, but they can be helpful to a point. It's a sign and seal of God's promise, a sign and seal of a personal relationship, a sign and seal of God's ongoing commitment to you and to your salvation. It is our house key as God's children, our passport as kingdom citizens, our title of ownership as heirs. It speaks to us of Christ, it confirms our hope in the gospel, and it strengthens us for a life of worship and service. And Calvin in his institute says this plainly, quote, In baptism the Lord promises forgiveness of sins. Receive it and be secure, end quote. And what I want to say as we close is that we need to be willing to grapple with biblical language. I I hope you know that I'm not suggesting that baptism does any of these things by itself or that it is even the instrument whereby these things are imparted to the believer. No, it's through faith. It's through faith and through faith alone that these blessings come. But if the only way that you and I deal with these ideas in Scripture is in the context of explaining why they don't apply to baptism, then we are really cutting this piece of wood against the grain. And you are missing out on the beauty and symbology and theology of Scripture. Don't cut the the board against the grain. Go with the grain. And recognize that these allusions and these connections and these relationships are bringing out to us rich and wonderful and glorious pictures of God's goodness and God's promises of grace that are communicated to us not only in the preached word, but also in what Augustine calls the visible word, the sacraments, and in this case, baptism. Amen. Let's bow together. Gracious God and Father, we are a people that wrestle so much in this way. We are constantly offering qualifications because we want to be very careful, Lord. We don't want to be misunderstood. We want to speak only what your word has said. We want to say all that your word has said. And yet our finite and fallible understanding trips us up so often and in so many ways. So help us, Lord. Correct us. Critique us. Teach us. Lead us. Give our mouths the words to speak. Give our minds the categories to think clearly about what your Spirit has made known, not only concerning baptism, O Lord, but concerning every aspect of your glory and your work that you have revealed in your Son by your Spirit. Bless us and watch over us as we return to our homes. May we glorify you in this new week. May you give to us the joy of our salvation. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.